So, I will talk a bit about product fold in general. Well, not so much about the physics of folding, but more about the computational methods. But it's there is um, somehow some type of relationship between it. It's not so. It, it's more. But the focus is really: Can we predict the structure of a protein using no other information really in the sequence? Well, other information, but not using a template to build it on. At least not directly. Uh, and of course, I will give you a bit of background about folding. I give you a bit of history, and I will particularly talk about. Rosetta, which is the David Baker method that is stated out, and then I will end with um, uh, content predictions or what has happened the last few years in, in that field. So the idea is to do to predict the structure of a protein without any other knowledge. We really and for this is what happens, of course, in, um, in, uh, for a protein in the cell, it folds. But it doesn't have any template to be folded on, it's just folding. It's just folding. The idea is of course, that you could use it when homology modeling is not possible. Uh, so, but, uh, unfortunately, from, from a practical point of view, this homology model not possible is getting rarer and rarer because we have more and more structures and more and more better better sequence methods to detect them. So the number of proteins, I'm not talking about it, but the number of proteins that actually need that you can do this for is quite small. And many of these proteins you cannot do by homology modeling are actually disorders, they are anyway very hard to fold. Uh, so we have the solving we have the um, by the way, at least it's, we, we, we would like to be able to say, can we really design a product? There's a practical part that is actually basically the reverse problem that is, might have a bigger practical impact. That is actually to design products. You say, I want to make a product that looks like this. And uh, so, given a structure, can we design a product? And that's, of course, be, I mean, the, the classical enzyme problem with product design was for. Uh, and something washing powder you wanted them to be able to break down fat or something and that you did not want them to unfold at uh, 90 degrees when you boil when you wash your water when you wash your clothes at a high temperature so they uh, that so that is not used really so you want you want to make it more stable and for people people did this they put, they put in disulfide bonds and they put in a uh, replaced the packing a little bit so they, it was done very much on an ad hoc trial basis, but if you could do it on the computer first, you really say, oh, this is what I want, that would be, I mean, you wouldn't ha you had, had, had to, could avoid a lot of experimental work. Um, but there are also other problems, you want to design good vaccines, so you want to design um, drugs, like mean, peptides do drugs, etc. Et et so there are also more like nanomaterial, uh, mechanical things. You want to design a protein that can bind gold particles and you want to purify the gold from the dirty water, something like that. There, there are a lot of things you could imagine to do. And there has been a lot of, actually quite a lot of progress here in the last decade also. I've not really talked about it, but it's the methods are very similar. So the underlying methodology is very similar, but Instead of trying to fold the protein, you're trying to optimize the same type of energy functions, but given a fixed structure. Uh, so, uh, so basically, you, you you can still if you go back to structure prediction, you can. Somehow described it also as approaches doing two different things. One is actually you really put it as a pure computational problem. So you define some model, some initial computational model. So and you find a 
so you find how you score this model and then you try to solve it you know, optimally. You don't care how it falls. And you have to try and find optimal. Excuse me, sorry. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Is this for the basic course in chemistry? No. No. Okay, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is, then you don't care really what, how you do it. If you do this in 10 dimensions or if you do this with uh, uh, breaking the protein into pieces, whatever, it doesn't really matter as long as it's, you find a good answer. Uh, but uh, alternative, of course, you, you would like to discover physics. You really would like to see a simulator from there. Uh, and then you were just running for long enough. And uh, although I, I say it's no hope due to large search space, but it's, it's at the moment it's kind of unrealistic to do it. But there are actually a few small proteins that have you can fold because they are so fast folding. So basically it's running molecular dynamic simulations, which we no, don't talk about in this course, but we, I think we'll talk about the next course, or in a like, later course. But you're running simulation, basically, you try to simulate this motion of protein, and if you just run long enough, you, you, and the model is good enough, you will be able to maybe fold the protein. And there has been some pro folding progress there the last few years, thanks to some special hardware computers, and also... Uh, Quite accurate, accurate models, but they are owned for extremely small specific proteins. So the same thing you come to the folding functions. Like, so idea of what you would like to understand is the physics. So you really use physics, but what, what, what is, but the point is of course what level of physics you want to describe. You, it's not really easy to use a quantum level description because really that is kind of I mean we too time consuming. It works for good for benzene rings and that, but not so much bigger systems. Uh, so really, what level of description do you want to use? And actually, the methods that kind of work use kind of method of a lot of statistical probabilities. But the same thing as we had in the parameters, like what is the probability that these two are in contact? So really, that's just observation. But of course, the observation somehow reflects the physics also. It doesn't affect maybe the energy, but it, but it affects the free energy. Uh, but you also use known definition. If you don't have full recognition, you really use some kind of templates. Anyway, because you want to say that proteins probably can borrow things from other proteins. Uh, but yeah, but the problem is still even if we. Oh, you can skip it. So principle we have. Two sort of central problems. We want to have a good description of energy and we want to be able to sample the problem. Uh, so the energy problem is was basically uh, is to put a lot of again a lot of statistical terms term together. A sample problem is there's lots of different methods tried. I'll try to describe some of them today. But in principle, it goes down to simplifying this particular protein, not trying to include all, everything all the time. Limit the amount of possible confirmations that you don't try everything. Sometimes you use the lattice models, you use lattices, the fixed point of space. But you can also use uh, other simplifications, that's not using all the atoms or using uh, skipping the hydrogen, so not using including water you want. The many different degrees of simplification. And for the same form, is basically the same as for getting a lot of monkeys to write the book to Shakespeare. If you just have a lot of time, it will happen. And a lot of monkeys. So, of course, if you just take thousand monkeys and they have random letters sooner or later, you will have all the Shakespeare work there. But probably, so probably uh, it will uh, most likely be, be at the end of the universe we ask that. So basically, yeah, enough, enough computational power would maybe help. But it, honestly, even today, even if you had enough computational power, most likely the accuracies of it, the met models we have are not good enough. So we really need higher accuracy models. So of course you, you would like, want to build. You want this machine that folds things to take the to the end on it. So, okay, so let's start with uh, 
uh, molecular mechanics. So basically, we, we haven't talked about molecular dynamics, but in principle, you have uh, uh, describing uh, uh, every interaction between every atom in a protein you, from from uh, using basic quantum mechanical descriptions or or uh, estimates that are common. So you, you know the size of the atom, you know the bond length between atoms, you know the uh, angles and energies. So this is and this has been around for since the 70s, and uh, what well, Nobel Prize couple years ago, basically for these type of things and. So we are pretty good at doing simulation of proton. So you then you just use Newton's second law and you just iterate through time. So you use a small time you have a protein and you use a small time step and move a little bit and move a little bit and move a little bit a little bit. And you repeat this millions of times. The problem is that of course that we are in the order of simulating nanoseconds to milliseconds mainly. And if there are a few proteins that that uh, for the milliseconds, but most uh, well, the for the millisecond, but most simulations are in microseconds, so at least a thousand orders of magnitude is too slow. I will tell you a little bit about, there are some tricks about it. So one, in particular, one trick is actually that you can parallelize it. It's not because you, you it's not that you, the problem of folding a protein is not, uh, I mean, you can take it, it just takes some time. But actually, what, what the main limit is that you have to pass an energy barrier. So you can think about you have a protein, like that. So you have this, some kind of what, coordinate here. So this is some um, coordinate. So it's unfolded and folded. And you need to have some energy barrier in your pass over. And for just from statistical physics, of course, we, we know that the high this energy barrier is the longer time it will take to pass over it. But and but it, but it's not a if this is a very quick pass over, it's not that you need to, you need once you're over it, you fall down very quickly. And of course the probability is if you try twice, you have twice the chance to pass over it in the same amount of simulation time. If you try it hundred times, you have hundred times higher chance to pass over it. As long as there's not too many steps in between. So basically, you can parallelize things by running many, many simulations in parallel, and then just recording once you pass over a barrier. Well, it doesn't have to be on one barrier, you can be several barriers. And whenever you pass over one barrier, you keep on starting over there again. So that, that's how this folding at home works. That is uh, basically using tens of thousands of computers in people's home, and that people are running. Uh, Simulations at night when you don't use the computers. So they have, I lost some machines, they have about half a million, a million computers doing uh, these type of simulations and then, then they have collected results. How long are the running times for those simulations even with half a million computers? You, still but you, you, you divide everything in. Uh, well, you don't run one thing at all, you divide it into blocks around it. I don't really, but they, so normally I think what the key thing is that you. You don't want to have something running more than a few hours on one machine. And, uh, and you have, if something breaks down, you need a system that actually starts somewhere else instead. Because it's, of course, people turn off the machine. You know, people do things. Uh, they will start playing games instead and doing things. So you have to have a system that's kind of robust. And of course, a lot of the time is wasted, but really you have a lot of these simulations on it. Uh, as a, every one, they call, call it work units, and it takes anything from a few hours to a few days. But don't make a few, few hours. I guess the practical thing is to run in a few hours. But you don't want to have things to run in a few sec seconds because it takes too much time to, to transport the data there, and you don't want to have things that take a few days because the probability that someone turns off the machine is too, is too big. Uh, so from this, uh, okay, you can find exactly what I somehow tried to describe here, but in two dimensions. So you have basically uh, the energy here. So this is native structure. This is the number of contacts that occur. So this is some measure how far away from the net constant. And this is somehow how compact the structure is. So this is kind of unfolded and it's extended. The radius duration is bigger. And then once it's here, it can still be compact, but folded in the wrong way. And then here is the lowest energy or free energy is down there. 
So this in this case there was an old uh, small this is a very very small protein and they run for one month on a cray. It's a bit old, but anyway. But um, we should be able to look at what you do if you go here. Oh, let me see. I need to do this. So this is the way. Welcome back to DLTV. I'm Veronica Belmont. Hey, and I'm Robert Heron. And so you've got some information on folding at home. Exactly what it is you're folding? Yes, indeed. We are the we're very big advocates of the folding at home project, and it's basically a way of using those extra cycles in your computer to help out with a project that's dedicated toward exploring, you know, what proteins are doing and how they work, mm -hmm. and what can go wrong, and basically how to avoid what goes wrong. And we had a little uh, trip down to Stanford University to talk to. Professor Pondy, who runs the project. Oh, cool. And I believe we have a little video to show off with an interview for him explaining exactly what it is that proteins are doing and how they do work. So let's take a look at that. Could you explain the protein folding process in the animation right behind you? So what we're looking at here is um, a, a, one of the sort of landmark simulations from folding at home. It's a very long simulation. And the visualization does not show all the detail, <coughs> because if I showed all the detail, you wouldn't be able to see everything. So for one thing, I've removed all the water from the visualization. There's all this water that goes into the calculation, because proteins in space aren't very interesting, but proteins in water are the way things work. But if I showed you all the water, you wouldn't be able to see any, everything. Also, in this protein, I've sort of colored things in different ways, that some stuff is, is solid, and some stuff is shown in these little sticks. These things are the amino acids that come off the protein backbone. And the protein is made up of like a chain of different amino acids, and each one has a different chemical characteristic. And I'm only showing the ones that, I, that are interesting for the purpose of this movie in Spaceville. These are the ones that are hydrophobic, um, uh, the ones that are aromatic uh, from, in terms of chemical language. And what we're looking at here in this movie is that the protein actually did not fold so far. It's actually collapsed into something kind of random and, and misfolded. And in some ways, it's kind of a lot like someone who doesn't know how to parallel park, that's trying to parallel park, and that they, you know, they get into the space and they're kind of stuck there. Once you're stuck, you can't really sort of just fix it. You, you basically have to do what you can or basically come out of the parking spot and come back in. Once it breaks out, it's actually going to come out, and then kind of like a drunk guy trying to parallel park, he's going to try to come back in, and it's actually not going to get it right on the second time, and then come back out and come back in. And every time it does it, it gets something a little more right, as we see in this movie. And that actually helps it fold on its way. So right now it's still basically sitting in this first collapse state, although it's been exploring lots of different possibilities. So this is what we're seeing here, is that this is one of the first unfolding events in this part of the simulation. And um, it sort of came out of the parking spot and came back in. Uh, it came out again, and it's coming back in. And now it's basically uh, trying to do things, uh, trying to get to its folded state. And certain parts of what it's doing are right, and certain parts are wrong. Um, and it's, it's just trying its best to, to get things into the right spot. It's going to go through this actually a couple different times. And it's actually already starting to make some progress. That that interaction actually is correct. And some of this stuff, this actually, it's hard to see it on uh, very visually, but this is actually forming an alpha helix right now. So this part's correct, and this part's correct. And actually now it's formed this triple part of the core, so that part's correct. And it just really needs to just be able to put these final pieces together, and actually, and that's when it does that. So it got each of those pieces, and finally just sort of flipped around and locked in. And now it's actually basically folded. This part is actually intrinsically unstructured, so it's going to flop around like a flag. But this part of the protein is, is the part that's folded. And it's pretty rigidly sitting there. Unlike the rest of the movie, where it's sort of moving around, here it's basically locked into the right state. Thank you, Professor Pondy. And of course, we've got to do the quick update for Team DL TV for the Folding at Home project. Uh, currently, we're still holding it uh, 20th position here. Let me take a look real quick on Not our bad. stats page. Not bad at all. We're about to break into the top. Uh, we're about okay. to break into the this 19. Way. We've got them all. So that's, that's the second part. So you get these people to. Because of the computers, you need to have the competition or not. They get the teams to compete with each other on that. That's, so that's... But this, when you saw this protein folding, it's, it's actually quite nice that it's... Uh, uh, that it's... Um, you see it move out, moving in. And this is pure... I mean, as pure physics as we can do it. 
It's really nothing statistical, nothing that remembers those as data from other proteins. It's just interactions of different atoms that somehow average together in those simulations. But that is, this case is parallel. Nowadays, there are methods, or I mean, particularly it's one group that has developed specific hardware that you can run very, very long simulation to do the same thing. Uh, so, unfortunately, those, it's, it's not very practical because the problem is that they for bigger proteins and fall slower, it doesn't work. It's just time is just thousands or million times slower. So people have tried to see different things, and so the idea is of course trying to simplify the model. So if you have fewer atoms, fewer degrees of freedom, it's going to be faster. So you can basically have simple thing you can done is basically just a lattice. You can say, okay, we don't care what it looks like, we just put it on core that's fixed in the room. And you have different types of lattice. You can also f have methods that are uh, more fine grained, or you can have just um, lattice that just describes the rotation bonds, you know, the high psi angles we talked about the other week. So you can describe it in different and you have, what's what, what, and you can continue to see basically what you have here. But what has really come out is actually this fragments approach. It's very useful. So basically, you use fragments approaches that are from known structures and then try to combine them. And this started uh, also in the mid 90s. So David Baker and Rosetta, the kind of most used program, but David Jones has a program Fragfold and even Jim Bowie and others have earlier programs. So the the idea of this kind of model is, 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 is that um, well, the idea is that the folding landscapes look like this somehow. So you have something that you fold down there, and you, but there are many, many, many different to go there. So you have, but you should, ideally, if you start from one place, you end up there always at the end. And this is somehow an illustration of both folding for, well, at least in native structures. So you would like to have a landscape look at this, because if you have this, it would be quite easy to find this, because you just walk down, you have to pass some barriers, but you work. Keep on going down, down, down. However, if you want to describe this energy, of course, this is kind of this free energy here is some of many terms. And one thing we know is that if the energy difference between an unfolded state and a folded state, so the free energy, so how stable is the proton? The energy difference is actually quite small. It's an order of 5, 10, 20 kK per mole, something like that. So it's not very strong. We know that we only have to raise the temperature. So some, often to some 40 degrees, something like that, and the proton unfold. So it's not very thing. Or you add a little bit of urea, the proton unfolds. And we calculate this energy as basically a sum of thousands of different terms. So if there even is a small, small error in each of these terms, it can end up to something that's much, much bigger than uh, 5, 10 kcals. And one hydrogen bond is more or less 1 kcal. So if you have like thousand hydrogen bonds and we have one percent error in all these we're gonna have which is kind of accurate at like nine percent accuracy is quite good but then we have 100 kcals error we can have 100 kcals error in that which is 10 times basically so it's really hard to get the energy function good off and particularly we actually need to do we need to include water and water is actually is, is one is a very complicated molecule you only have three atoms, or so two hydrogens and one atom, but still, it has a dipolar moment. It really has a distributed charge between the hydrogens and the, wa the water. And it's uh, it, it's a good mo model of water. It's, it's very difficult. There are better and better models there. Nowadays, people are getting better, but it's, it's one of the most difficult compounds to simulate in nature. It seems like freezing to ice is extremely difficult. Uh, but it's not only that the, the water model is difficult, it's also that it takes some time to uh, to um, equilibrate. So if you put the protein in a water box, and the water, we had a water already fast, and put the protein in there, and take away all the water that overlaps, it takes a certain amount of time before it had the water in the right shape again. Of course. You don't have a hole in the water, you want to make a hydrogen bond, hydrogen bond networks. And also, it slows down the, the, the uh, motion, because it, it definitely takes some time. So you can't just put the protein in the water and then just calculate the energies. You need to have it there and give some time. 
Now the problem is actually we are not looking for the minimum energy of them. We look for the minimum free energy. And then we need to take into account entropy. If you do an empty simulation, so entropy is implicit because of course that's part of the motion of everything we see. But if you want to have a single molecule, we need to do some estimates of en entropy. Uh, and uh, there are of course estimates to do that. You can try to do it if you have a single molecule. It's not, they're not that accurate. And, uh, or then, what are time consuming? And finally, basically, what was illustrated in this movie is that if you, if the as we do this parallel parking, it's like if you're stuck in the wrong position, the best thing you can do is back out again. So if you have a model that, for instance, has the side chains like that, but it should be like that, they're not going to pass through each other. It's impossible because it's basically a ton of all forces that are going to stop them. So you have to unfold the proton and fold it back. That therefore takes a long time. Unless you do some tricks, but hmm. so then, what can we do to do this? Can we really learn from how proton really fold? I mean, I think most likely folding. Nobody knows, but this this kind of, this movie is probably not a bad description of how proton will fold. It's probably very simplified. It probably takes the path very straightforward. It's probably so many different paths up and down and things like that. But, it, but it's more or less, that's something uh, you, you could imagine how proton folds. But uh, we also know, for instance, for secondary structure prediction that we have actually quite good description of the secondary structure, at least of some part of protein, from just the sequence. Just look at the sequence itself. So that's going to form, form, fold. And there are studies showing that at least some parts of the secondary structures, and some parts of the, well, not only secondary, but some parts of protein of the collapse quite fast to hydrophobic things. So there, so there are probably parts that are folding more rapid than other parts. And then we can have local problems, local things. So, and so the, the idea that basically David Baker has taken, and all the whole fragment approach is, is, I'm not sure it was really conscious from the beginning, but at least it, it basically can be divided into two things. It's like that you have, the, the protein actually has like a little local preference. We know that locally, at least not the whole sequence, but at least large part of the sequence, has a preference to be, uh, in a sort of secondary structure, a certain confirmation, basically a heel sheet, a loop, or some turn, or something like that. Some parts may, may be more flexible, and you don't have preference, but some parts at least have it. And then, so if you could combine these local preferences with something that describes the overall shape of the protein, then you might be able to do something. So, and for the overall shape, you know, I guess you have to start thinking some early courses when you have so that protein fold, protein stability is dominated by hydrophobicity. So what is it makes that protein is, is forming as we, it's, I mean, there are, I mean, you, you can think about it that it, it could be uh, uh, from um, Pauling, uh, Linus Pauling, you, you can see it's hydrogen bonds. So basically you have secondary structures from hydrogen bonds, that, but the, the thing is like, if they wouldn't have secondary structure from hydrogen bonds, they would make hydrogen bonds to water. So it's really not, I mean, so basically, the reason why we have hydrogen bonds in the, in the background of the structure of a protein is not so much because the hydrogen bonds are very strong. It's just that not having a hydrogen bond is very bad. And if you fold it to something that doesn't have a hydrogen bond, it's bad. But really, the hydrogen bond between two protein molecules or between hydrogen bond between protein and the water doesn't really matter. It's part of the same. But clearly, we want to avoid having hydrophobic groups in contact with water. Because that breaks the hydrogen bonds of the water, and it's very costly. We don't have want to have uh, lipids or fat in water. We don't have to take it's like oil and water; it does collapse together. You want to minimize the surface or the lipid drop into the contact water. So the, the same thing with proteins. They want to take all the hydrophobic groups or the hydrophobic amino acids and put them in the center. Unless you remember protein, that's another story. Uh, so this is basically what. David Bacon also done with Rosetta. So let's see if we'll see what he says about that. Nice music. The problem you're focusing on at Rosetta at home 
is the prediction of protein structures from their amino acid sequences. Almost all human diseases are caused by mutations in proteins that affect uh, their three-dimensional structure. This is also a very nice statement. I, I'm very sure that broken legs are very caused by mutations, but uh, I'm not going to argue with so him. It's a nice question anyhow. Protein structures, we can understand how mutations cause disease and uh, from there uh, perhaps go on to develop therapies. I'm working on trying to design immunogens that will elicit antibodies against HIV, so uh, a critical part, part of a, a vaccine, design proteins that will present that piece of HIV at just the right confirmation, so that if that protein, once it's taken off a computer and turned into a real physical protein that's put into a person's blood, it will cause that person to make antibodies uh, against the, the epitope of HIV. Up until recently, it's been pretty much thought impossible to reliably predict the structure of proteins from their sequences. Instead, protein structures are currently determined using time-consuming and expensive experiments, which can only be applied to a small subset of proteins. If instead we could accurately and reliably predict protein structures, it would revolutionize much of molecular biology. To carry out this work, we've developed a computer program called Rosetta. Success in our work would have broad-ranging implications for human health, ranging from the development of a vaccine for HIV to the eradication of malaria. The sequence of amino acids that make up proteins is directly determined from the genetic code, otherwise known as the sequence of molecules in DNA. DNA, like proteins, is also made of molecular subunits with specific properties. Within the nucleus, a kind of imprint of DNA is transcribed into a similar molecule called RNA. Carrier molecules transport amino acids to an enormous structure called a ribosome. The ribosome translates the information in RNA into a chain of amino acids. Think about putting a rope in a box with no gravity, and think about how many different ways this rope could actually fall in that box. Um, so, you know, the number of combinations and the number of possibilities are pretty much astronomical. <coughs> a strand of amino acids, the order of which has been determined by the genetic code, can indeed be thought of as rope or chain like. However, the properties of the links, in this case amino acids, cause portions of the chain to be attracted to or repelled from each other, as well as elements in the cellular environment. What the Rosetta program does is calculate the likelihood of these interactions between segments of the chain based upon favorable energy levels. The most likely 3D structure of the chain will take the least amount of free energy to fold. Last summer, I started modifying Rosetta to be used with the Boink Distributed Computing Platform. Before Boink, we had around 400 computers that we could run our calculations on locally. But now with Boink, we have thousands of computers um, that we could run our jobs on located all around the globe. And it's really exciting to see how it developed. What we're doing at Rosetta at home is analogous to searching the surface of a large rocky planet for the lowest elevation point. We have a, imagine you have a team of human explorers working with you and they're all exploring around the planet. The team is small, it's quite likely that no explorer will actually find the lowest elevation point, particularly if there are a lot of tall mountains that lead to explorers getting trapped in particular places on the planet. Now instead imagine that you have a very large team of explorers and they each parachute down randomly on the surface of the planet and then start searching for the lowest elevation point. The more explorers you have, the more likely it is that at least one of them will find the lowest elevation point on the planet. Now in Rosetta at home, we're instead searching the energy landscape for a protein, trying to find the lowest energy structure for an amino acid sequence. The more computers there are doing these searches, the more likely it is that somebody will actually find it. In each step of the Rosetta search process, a move is made in which part of the protein structure is randomly altered. The top left panel of the screensaver shows each move as it is being made. If Rosetta calculates that the energy has decreased with the move, it is accepted and displayed in the middle panel. The lowest energy structure found so far is displayed in the next panel over. Shown below this is the actual shape of the protein, if it is known. 
panel to the right tracks how closely each accepted move compares to the known protein structure. The bottom panel tracks the energy of each move. Okay, we can see this. The energy mm -hmm. after the most recent move is located on the right. In the bottom right corner is a graph. Because it's a whole new step forward in the relationship between scientists and the public. Uh, to solve the problem of protein structure prediction, it's quite clear that um, it's really not... Actually, the, what they have nowadays is even more fun. It's called. This is the. If, if you have nothing to do, you can play games. So they have a fold.it game. Fold it. So you can. Uh, you can basically. I don't think I've installed this computer, but basically you can run this put in folding in yourself. And it's not that you can, you can only even like design a protein change mutation or try to fold it together by pulling force in different ways etc. So it's kind of fun. Um, but um, yeah, that's not for today. Mm. So yeah, so in before just before the break, let's have a short summary of Rosetta. Mm. So the idea with Rosetta is that uh, uh, so my, uh, and people done it before. Okay? You, you want to have a description of energies. You basically, you take this parabolic potential and other potential and put it in a good way. And the new thing with Rosetta was, Rosetta was on the first, but one, what one of the first points to do was to take these kind of local fragments. So you really have local fragments to put them together. So instead of trying all possible confirmations of all side chains or all, all, all atoms, you take fragments. So what you do is that you do for each, you have a protein here that started from the blue side to the red side. And for each part of the protein, each small fragment, which is normally three or nine residues, you look have a, you have fragments that you think it can look like. And this is you basically search other proteins, not homologous proteins, but other proteins that are in the database that are uh, could have this. And they combine this together. So you take, okay, I try this one, this one, and 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 this one. Okay, it was not so good, and I replace this one with this one instead, and this one with this one. And you do that. And then you basically try to search an energy landscape to get better, better models. Uh, so you have you have this fragment library in your sequence, and you try to get two structures. So basically start. Expect you find the first fragments, and you have a few hundred fragments for each. I mean, and you normally have two different sizes of these ones in the default settings, and uh, they are rare. So basically, if there's if it's very clear that some kind of local fragments is also going to be helix, the old fragments are going to look like a helix. So if you have a very strong structural preference for being a helix, one part of the protein, you're going to be they all are going to be helical. If the some part is going to be uh, always loop, it's going to be a loop. If it's something that you don't have no idea, it's going to be random different things. You know that is going to be all different. <coughs> but anyway, they're all going to look like proteins. They're all coming from proteins. They, nothing is going to look completely wrong because everything is a fragment that looks at least locally like something that can come from a protein. So you still have, of course, even a much smaller range of possible confirmations than you would have if you would have. Uh, uh, all possible because if you rotate all the bonds and angles, you would end up with things that have no hydrogen bonds, it looks very strange, and, and that could, could do completely wrong. And then you would have to have an energy function that compensates with that, then you have to weight this energy function to everything else, it would be more complicated. But here you know, locally this is a part that comes from a protein, and it's going to look like a protein. And then you have some kind of scoring function. So that should have a clear meaning in the structure, and have, ideally have a path, and basically it's basic to have the felicity. Basically, you want to find, combine these fragments and find something that is as heterophobic as possible. But, uh, you don't, but at the same time, you don't want to overlap that thing with that. This is a smaller thing. But, and you want maybe some extra like hydrogen bonds between beta streets and stuff. But basically, you want to have maximum heterophobicity using the fragments. So you take your fragments and you just uh, generate some random thing. And you put the, you replace one fragment with another fragment generate 200 structures and keep on doing this many, many times. As you saw in the background of the movie. And you have... And, and you do this many times. 
So you also need to add tens of hundreds or even millions of, of, of short simulations that you need decoys. So some of these are going to be completely wrong. But if it's the same thing as we had when we looked at this. Uh, the Picos method is like if there are one group of them that look, look the same, that might very likely be correct. If they all look random, you'll probably need to keep it running. But certainly, there's one set of the low ME ones that always look the same, that's quite likely to be correct. And so you basically find a cluster, the biggest cluster here, but also you should have low energy also. And you can keep on doing this more details, and uh, you often end up with something that looks maybe like this. So you often have, this is, of course, this is some test case. You have some scores, so this is your energy, and this is the, actually how far away are from the correct answer. So the number of RMC. So there is the score of the matrix structure. So it has minus 10, and this has a score of minus 8. But you see, this certainly there are bad models that are 5 or 6 ohms from away that are pretty good scores, but the lowest ones actually are here. And particularly, so that this, and these are actually 2 ohms from away that are pretty good, I would say, in these cases. So if you look at the structure that looks like if something in here that has a high, okay model, uh, score, but it's not the best one, it looks like that. But this one is actually rather similar. So, let's see, let me skip this. Mm. Well, so they did there's a number of examples and they can find low energy in many cases. So the, the, this is what's developed in the, in the mid, in the, uh, during 2000, like in 2005 or something, hasn't happened so much. What happened in the later stage, and we're not discussing much today, is that they actually added the high resolution protocol to this. So basically what they do, is when you generate a model like this. This model here doesn't describe all the side chains accurately. It doesn't but what you, what you can do is you can take all these models, or the best ones, and you can build the side chains. You can put in the side, you have the side, you can build more accurate side chains, and even do some small refinement of the side chains. And you're doing this using the, what we call the high resolution protocol. So here you basically you make a small, small change of some angle here on the backbone, a little bit change in a random place. And then you have a fast algorithm to rebuild all the side chains. So given you take away all the side chains from the, from the backbone and you put the new back again. So, of course, if you had this problem you had in the beginning when the teeth were collapsing, and now you build a small, had a small change in the backbone, so you, because you take away everything and build up again, you can actually end up having this path through each other in one step, if you're lucky. And uh, so then you do some minimization, basically you have more things, uh, just a little a bit, and you evaluate the energy, and you repeat this many, many times. So here, the, the, so, and, and this algorithmic fast building side chains is kind of a well-known problem, because it's actually, it's not, it's, theoretically it should be difficult, but it's actually not that hard to do, because the problem can be uh, uh, divided into sub problems. Uh, and uh, so then you had, I mean, so they had examples, and I have actually made in some blind tests, you had five out of six small projects that had models less than 1.5 ohms from away from the native structure, which is NMR quality, I would say. That's, these are, but only five out of 16. So it's not in every case. but. Uh, it works. It's easy for alpha helical proteins for beta sheet proteins, but it, it works in, in all cases. And it works for small proteins, not for maybe 100 residues or something. But much bigger than the one we saw in the first folding movie. So, now, this is basically how, what, what the field was like five years ago. But after the break, I will talk about what happened since then. Basically, I will talk about contact predictions.